Okay, so we'll get started. So we'll continue the discussion of nuclear chemistry and then we'll have a brief introduction on coordination chemistry. I know I won't assign homework for the remaining of semester, uh, but instead we'll have random quiz. So please read chapter 24, that's about nuclear chemistry. For the next two lectures, we'll be talking about coordination chemistry. So please read the chapter 23, but I just wish to, ha to highlight the important topics in these chapters, okay? Um, we talk about radioactive compound can undergo decay reaction and uh, generate radiation, right? So generally, nuclear reaction or nuclear decay, we're dealing with the change in its nuclei instead of valence electrons. So, and also, when we were talking about nuclear decay, it usually involves the creation of a, a new element Okay, so it can emit particles such as alpha particle and beta particles, as well as various type of uh, pho pho photons such as gamma rays, okay? About these emitted energy, so alpha particle is obviously a very high energy substance, so it can be regarded as an oxidant, and uh, based on the equation down here, Alpha particle can be a ionizing radiation causing the ejection of electrons. Okay, so remember for oxidation reaction, what happened to the electrons, right? Okay, so um, for the low energy radiation, it generally is in the form of heat. Um, so because when this energy is emitted, the molecule that collide with it can absorb the energy and usually it's in the form of heat. So it usually is not dangerous. So generally we are exposed to radiation constantly. Okay, but the small amount of radiation is usually harmless. So it really has to do with the intensity of this radiation, which we'll explain in a little bit. Okay, so the higher energy radiation was, will result in uh, formation of positive charge ion, and such positive charge ion can undergo other chemical reactions. Then you're we dealing with valence electrons of other matters. Okay, so this is a simple image to details what's happening when you're exposed to radiation. So in a form of high energy radiation, you can cause an ejection of electron from the water. So remember on the oxygen, there are some lone pairs, right? If you remember how to draw the Lewis structure of water molecule. Okay, so then you get this ionized water and it can react with another water molecule and generate hydroxyl radical. So for biological system, generally radical is bad. This hydroxyl radical is oxidizing species, okay? It's gonna oxidize your lipids, fat, it's bad, okay? So if it oxidizes uh, DNA, it's gonna cause problem during the transcription process. So when there's radiation uh, irradiating your DNA, usually mu mutation will happen or it can completely destroy the genetic information that's stored in the DNA and an RNA. So in that, as I mentioned, radical is bad. It can also attack these biological molecules. And here's an example of glass that has been irradiated to high energy of radiation. It changed color because the structure of your glass change due to the radiation, okay? So this is, I think this is probably the one single most important image for this chapter. I think, I don't think knowing exact uh, nuclear decay reaction is important, but knowing the penetration of your alpha, beta, and gamma particle or photons is fairly important. So since I mentioned alpha particle is very high energy, so it's gonna cause some radical forming reaction. So the penetration depth into human tissue is very short because it immediately reacts with water molecules because you have so much of it, right? And then uh, beta particle can pen it has slightly lower energy so it can penetrate a little deeper, but not too deep. But for gamma ray, you can really go through the body. So here is, I know the unit is in electron volts, but you can easily translate that into joule, right? Okay, so, so these are common type of radiation. So for alpha particle, obviously you can see it's much larger than x-ray that we would commonly encounter at the airport and the hospital, right? So x-ray can see through things. And then for the gamma rays, it can 
the penetration depth in air, as you can see on the right, is much deeper. So, let us look at the comparison of the penetration depth in air versus water, because the presence of water can decrease uh, that penetration depth. Okay? So, when we are talking about ionizing ra radiation, we have to consider a few factors. Okay? So, what kind of radiation it is? So, I mentioned um, alpha beta and the x ray and gamma ray, right? And also the energy, the amount of energy these radiation hold. Okay? And third, how much radiation, how much energy in total are we talking about? And is it concentrated at one spot or over a whole area that will determine the outcome of radiation? And also the substance you're dealing with. So we know um, when you are getting x ray image taken, usually you are asked to wear a lead uh, based uh, vest to protect the rest of your body, right? So when you go see a dentist, sometimes they will ask you to do an x ray. So that's what that vest is for. So the lead, when it's thick enough, it can absorb the radiation. For example, for the nuclear bomb shelter, usually you will have a door that is super thick that made it with either lead or special concrete that prevent the radiation from entering the shelter. Okay, so the guy that, in memory of the guy that discovered x-ray, Rogen is the unit for radiation. So what does that even mean? That means the amount of radiation that can cause the formation of this amount of electrical charge. So remember, radiation can cause ejection of electrons, right? The amount of energy required to produce this amount of electrical charge in one kilogram of air. So that is unit for radiation. I mean, this is a very vague idea of what radiation would do, okay? But when as the amount of radiation, the dosage increase, it's caused a lot of irreversible damage to human bodies. When they're slow, nothing happened, and then chromosome, that is like your DNA and genetic information. So it can cause some damage. Sometimes it's nothing will happen. Sometimes uh, it will cause diseases. So when you have a little bit more of dosage, it will cause the damage to your white blood cell count. So when, that de when the amount of white blood cell decrease, you have a weaker immune system. Okay, so when it's go a little bit higher, it can cause the sterility in men, okay? Even higher, it can cause sterility in women. That means you cannot reproduce. You can't have kids, okay? So generally, people exposed to a lot of radiation, for instance, people worker working at the nuclear plants, there is very strict law in terms of how many hours they can work at the plant per year, okay? Because they're exposed to high amount of radiation all the time. If they're exposed to a lot of radiation, it's gonna cause death. This amount is fatal within hours, but generally when people are experience significant amount of radiation is going to cause a lot of problem in your body. So to put it into a different perspective of what happened to your body when you're exposed to radiation, this is a chart compiled by someone else. Uh, we know one significant thing is hair loss. So we know people are going through radiotherapy. That means using these uh, radiation to treat cancer one, it kills the fast growing cells, right? So generally, it causes loss of hair. So radiation is bad when there you have a lot of it, okay? And in nature, because there are trace amount of uranium everywhere, and then the radioactive form of uranium could generate radon, which is the gas. Um, you, you can find it on the periodic table. So we are constantly exposed to small amount of radiation. And of course, if you're living next to a nuclear plant, of course a lot of radiation. If you are working on a nuclear powered uh, submarine, since the nuclear reactor is right there, you're constantly exposing to radiation. So for application of radiation, I previously we mentioned there's some medical use, right, for the low energy radiations. For example, x-ray or a more advanced x-ray is called a computated tomography. So that means you can see a 3D image 
of what's going on in your body. And also there is a positron emission tomography. So that means you can digest or through injection, we put radioisotope into your body and by looking at the intensity of positron that emitted from your body, we can look into the biological activity of your body. All right, so now we'll get to the session on coordination chemistry. So it's all about bonding, okay? So let's consider an example. We know uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, so carbon and uh, oxygen are sharing electrons, right? And then we know sodium chloride they're held together by electrostatic charge. We call that ionic bond. Okay, so let's think about a acid-base reaction in gas phase. So these are all gas. And we know it's going to generate ammonium chloride. So think about this process. The lone pair on the ammonia will grab this proton, right, this hydrogen, because we know when it dissociates, it has a positive, uh, it, due to the electronegativity, this has a positive charge and this is a negative charge, right? So in this case, when we're talking about covalent bond, their electron is shared, and based on the electronegativity of these atoms, it's gonna be partially negative and partially positive, right? So we'll have more electrons on this side, but in general, they're sharing electrons. To form this bond, the carbon has to give off two electrons. To form this bond, oxygen has to give off two other electrons to form this double bond. But in ionic form, all the electrons are on one side and leaving this sodium to be positive charge. Okay, so in coordination chemistry, we call it a dative covalent bond, okay? So that means it's in between the character of a, a pure covalent bond and ionic bond, okay? So in this case, this hydrogen, this proton, doesn't have any electron to share, right? Its electron is already being taken by this chloride. So that means it's donating that electron to the hydrogen. So if we think about the valence shell, valence electron of hydrogen, there's none, right? You basically just have your nucleus. There's no electrons, okay? But because the presence is at an empty s orbital, we can see it. This is the arrow. That means it's forming a coordination bond with the hydrogen. And that gives this a positive charge to form the ammonium chloride. Now think about this reaction in aqueous environment, okay? The hydrogen give off its electron because on the other side you have hydroxide, right? When it's CH2O, again, it grabs a hydrogen. In coordination chemistry, you can think of it as in a term of Lewis acid and base. That is another type of um, dated bomb. You have an electron donor and then you have an electron acceptor. Why did these bond form? That's because you have to think about delta G. When these complex form, everything is at the lower energy state, okay? So there's a various type of coordination compounds. Uh, for example, the first one, I believe that the borane species, so it forms a diborane. And then the second one is just an ionic type of lattice structure that is formed by coordination compound. And uh, the third one, I think it's somewhat special. So this is a carbon atom, these two. So these are carbonyl group. So generally, we would think carbonyl or carbon monoxide is inactive. However, we know this is poisonous. When you inhale carbon monoxide, it's going to cause some problem because your hemoglobin, your red blood cell, which has an iron center, this carbonyl group can bind to the iron and limit its oxygen transporting capability. Then you are deplete, you cannot have oxygen to sustain your life and causing 
problems. Okay, so for a, a special type of inorganic complex such as this uh, iron-based, di-iron-based complex, it actually can share the electrons on the, the carbonyl, forming this dimer. Okay, so you can actually solve it by X-ray crystallography. So you can use X-ray to solve the crystal structure of our compounds. Then there's also the compound D that is silicone. So we previously talked about that is an inorganic poly polymer. Okay, so it's, it's fine everywhere. Okay, so number E is a little bit more complicated. It is a what's so called Grubbs catalyst developed by uh, Robert Grubbs at Caltech. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in 2005. Basically, this is a very important catalyst to doing metathesis chemistry, which we'll briefly touch on. So what you're seeing here is there are some organic stuff, right? We call that ligand. So in biology, they call that ligand, okay? It's just different fields say things differently. So these organic ligands can donate electron to your ruthenium center. And then also you see chloral groups, right? So for such compound, what is you're really seeing is you have ruthenium center, okay? And then you have a phenyl group. So this is what's shown here, okay? And you have two chloro groups that bind to the ruthenium as well as phosphine. And when it's on top, this is uh, what's so called and heterocyclic carbene. So actually on top, when you have an N heterocyclic car carbene, it has this two lone pair electron on the carbon, which makes it very reactive. But when it's ruthenium, it forms a dative bond. We call it a dative bond, okay? Because in fact, ruthenium is positive charge. It's plus two state, okay? These ligand has no charge on it, okay? So it basically, the ionic charge is balanced by the chloral group, okay? But it's formed this air stable complex that has some very good catalytic activities that allow you to synthesize polymer and a lot of biologically active ingredient and drugs, okay? So Another example of common why we study coordination chemistry is uh, zeolite material. These are, I think in the previous chapters, you guys read about silicates, right? So these are the inorganic material that based on such structure, SiOx. And upon doping some aluminum and different metal in it, you can form these beautiful periodic network, okay? And that, based on these pore size, sometimes it can give you some very good separation properties. So in an industrial process, when we synthesize some organic compound, zeolite is commonly used to otherwise difficult separate mixtures. Not everything can be separated by distillation, especially if your boiling point are very similar to each other, right? So you can use zeolite. Another application of zeolite-like material is what we call molecular sieves. So uh, these are zeolite-based uh, material. We can actually tune the size. So a certain size of zeolite, they can selectively absorb water from your reaction mixture. Certain size of zeolite can absorb alcohol. When we talk about alcohol, there's ethanol, propanol, and, and even higher alcohol, right? So depending on these pore size, they can have very good a selectivity for different kind of organic compounds. Okay, so finally, this is another example of a dimer. So in fact, among these metal, they can form metal-metal bond. Usually, we deal with, in organic compound, we deal with triple bond. So that has to do with the valence electron of carbon. You can't really have anything higher than that. But for metal, in fact, you can make a in fact, there are examples where metal, among themselves, they can form five bonds. And this bond is actually weaker than a carbon-carbon bond. 
So I know this is, sounds absurd, but um, this is just why p get people interested in uh, cord ignition chemistry or so-called inorganic chemistry. So inorganic chemistry is originated, it's probably the oldest branch of chemistry. Okay, so because back in the days, although we do not have a systematic understanding of chemistry, but we already know when we mix these inorganic salt together, it's gonna give you some color. For painting back in the 1700 and 1600, or even before that, all these beautiful color, the color are originated from inorganic compound. So people have ways to make these pigments. So pigments refer to dye molecules and uh, these beautiful colors. So for the oil painting, it basically you get a paste of finely grounded inorganic substances that have very special color. And once it's dried, you have your beautiful painting. So the discovery of or establishment of inorganic chemistry, um, more modern inorganic chemistry, has to do with the contribution of Alfred Werner. So here's a short story. He's a German scientist. Okay, so he was awarded Nobel Prize in 1913 for his work on coordination compounds. But actually, he discovered coordination compound when he was 26, when he was pursuing his PhD in Switzerland. So he started doing research at 18. That is the same age as you guys are, right? So it's actually possible you start doing research early and it's very possible in a few years you guys can discover something really, really great. Um, but then there, I don't know how true that is, but he figured out this is what coordination compound look like. This is his preliminary data that get him Nobel Prize. Okay, so people know how to prepare these compounds, but they have different conductivity when you dissolve in water. So from high school chemistry, we know that the conductivity is proportional to the amount of ion that is present in the solution. Pure water is not very conductive. Okay, so Dr. Werner measured the conductivity of various platinum-based complex. And he found that for this one, it's essentially not conductive at all. Right? With your understanding of chemistry, we know, okay, well, this compound is probably not dissociating in solution, right? Okay, so you can do a reaction, a selective precipitation reaction. We already learned that. Silver ion with chloride, it forms precipitate. It's a thermodynamically favored process, right? So the free chloride ion can be precipitated by silver, so you can actually quantify how much free chloride is present in these complexes, right? That makes sense? So based on this data, Dr. Werner came up with the structure of coordination compounds. So remember when we talk about bonding, we talk about different shape of molecules and then we have these very complicated names for these uh, geometry, right? So why do we care about that? Okay, so in or inorganic chemistry, in order to define their structure, I mean, someone has to come up with a name for it, okay? So we're not gonna go into naming because we're just gonna save that for your actual inorganic chemistry class, uh, but I'll continue discussing different kind of geometry of these inorganic compounds. So as I mentioned, the, because the way it is structured, the amount of chloride that can be released by these complex is different. Okay, so that means for platinum, it can form six coordination bond with various type of uh, stuff, such as ammonia and chloride, okay? So scientifically, these are referred as ligand, okay? These are ligands on the platinum, and these are the counter ion that balance the charge, okay? All right, so when we look at cobalt-3, Dr. Warner also studied cobalt. So it's known that you can, by different synthetic methods, you can isolate these uh, isomers in pure form, okay? So you can crystallize it. Um, and I think for the next lecture, I'll do a demo on some coordination compound. Okay, so now I want you guys to get in groups to discuss how are the one on the left different than the one on the right? How are these two different? Okay, so obviously, we can see for the red form on the left, 
it's the chlorine atom is right next to each other. And then for the one on the right, the chlorine atom is on the opposite side. Okay, so that's what we refer as the cis form and trans form for inorganic compound. For organic compound, we have different definition for cis and trans, okay? But for inorganic compound, that's how we, we look at the position, the location in this complex, and then we decide whether it's cis and trans. And then in the next lecture, we will also briefly mention a theory that we can explain why the color of these two compounds are different. Okay? So let's talk about why not these type of compound exist as a planar structure or trigonal prison. Okay, so if you don't know what they look like, you can go into your book. I think in the earlier chapter, or the chapter 23, I believe, they have some structures of various type of geometry. Okay, so it has to do with its optimal uh, configuration, right? So depending on different configuration, they could have different energy state. Usually we refer the above compound as a M, a2, B4 compound, okay? So M stands for the metal, and then different substituent is you label it as A and B. So let's think about another compound, okay? How many structures can you generate for Ma2, B2? Okay, so I want you guys to take out a piece of paper and uh, start drawing them. You can draw a sphere and then label it as, as metal, okay? So how many compounds can you generate? Okay, so let's assume it form a planar structure, right? So you can have AABB, right? That's one. You can have A on the opposite side to each other, right? And B on the opposite side, so you get two type for the uh, a plane planar structure, right? And when we have four substituent, what does that remind you? When you have four atoms that connect to a central atom, what does that remind you of? What's a favorite geometry that sp3 carbon likes to adopt? Tetrahedral, right? So we can construct a tetrahedral structure. So, but unfortunately, because the configuration we, we have here is A2, B2, you can only draw one uh, isomer, right? It only have one isomer. It doesn't have other uh, configuration. But it gets more complicated when you have more ligand around the metal atom. And that gives you different properties. So let's go back to this ruthenium catalyst, OK? You can replace the ligands, and the type of ligand will affect its catalytic activities. So if I remove this phosphine, and replace with that methyl amine, okay? Essentially, this compound is now very active because the bonding is very strong. But if I replace it with pyridine, okay? Because this lone pair can delocalize, we'll get into that for the next few lectures, we well, simply change it to pyridine. Actually, this bond has become much weaker. So the ligand can come off and back on with the dated, with the dated uh, electron donating dated bond um, to form this uh, inactive species. Okay, so we can change the substitu uh, substituent around this metal center and change its catalytic activity and also its uh, reaction selectivity. So you can control the cis and trans stereochemistry of your final product. Okay, so let's go through some possibility of metal complexes. So when you have two ligands, so you have linear, okay? So we talk about the ML4, right? L stands for ligands, okay? So you have tetrahedral and planar structure. ML3, you only get trigonal planar, but as you get more complex, for the previously study, the ML spy is less common, but ML6 is very common for a lot of different metals. Okay, so if you look at it, it actually have two types. So this one, the octahedral, is more common, but in some cases you can get this 
a special arrangement called the prismatic structure. Okay, so the more ligand you have, it can get more complex. Okay, so pentagonal, bipyramidal. The last two are more rare, but see there you can have all these uh, different possibility for coordination compound. Okay, so before all of these ligands, what we call monodentate. That means you are donating two electrons to your metal center. There are other type of ligand, such as bidentate ligand, which is, this, is, this is the dimethyl uh, diamino ethane, right? So it can act like a claw that bind to the metal center. So again, if you think about a octahedral-like uh, structure, this ethylene diamine the linker can be between these two, right? And the linker can be between these two, right? And of course, there are different kind of diamines that give you a lot of complexity to your coordination compound, and that will give you different kind of catalytic activity because you're changing the electron configuration of your metal center, okay? So, uh, sorry, this, the structure blocked the chelation. So when you have multiple binding site to your metal, we call that polydentate, or we also call such compound as a chelate because there's a chelation effect. If we think of this octahedral structure, right, this one single molecule can form this very complex, beautiful structure, and this is what we call EDTA. We know it has excellent uh, binding uh, strength for a lot of different metal, okay? So what you're seeing here, see, even though the charge is much higher than the metal charge, okay, of course you will have counter ions to balance that charge. And then also let's look at this uh, porphyrin-like uh, structure. So this is what uh, nature used to harvest light and convert that photon energy into the energy it required to undergo metabolism. Right, so plants utilize such complex, this is a, the structure of hemoglobin, okay? But they share some structure similarity where it has multiple amine that bind to the metal center, okay? So let's go to your page 1052 and 53. When I talk about this uh, ethylene diamine, you can see it can form different kind of isomers for your complex. So if you look at figure 2311, it's on page 1053. So it's fascinating, right? Okay, so now I want you to look at figure 23.9. Nitro group can also act like, like a ligand, okay? And it has two isomers. So it's depending on how it's bind to the metal center. The color can be a little bit different. Here it had nitrite, cyanate, and thiocyanate. Okay, so that gives you a lot of complexity for your coordination compound. Okay, so for inorganic, this is a very brief overview of what you will see if you take an inorganic class. Okay, so first you have to, it's gonna remind you, you're gonna see Lewis structure, formal charge, electronegativity that already been discussed in general chemistry, right? So it will talk about bonding. What is chemical bonding? What holds molecule together? And then you'll learn about polarity. So polarity is just a, a characteristic of your type of bonding, right? And then, then there's symmetry operation and point group. Okay, so that has to do with when we talk about the multidentate or um, when we're talking about the symmetry of your inorganic complex. Okay, so of course it will get into quantum mechanics aspect of why these bonds are so strong or why these complex are stable. And then you will likely go into molecular orbital theory over again. Okay, so why? Because if you remember the shape of d orbitals, okay, so in some extent that dictate the geometry of your inorganic complex. Then there's a more complicated theory is a d orbital molecular theory. Then we talk about band theory and metallic bonding. So if you are interested in semiconductor, that will explain some of its character. Then of course we're gonna 
get into acid and base. There are some hard acid and some soft acid. There are a lot of definitions in that regard. And then there's the three big theory for uh, inorganic chemistry, the frontier orbital theory. I think that it has to do with acid and base. And crystal field theory and ligand field theory has to do with these core uh, coordination compounds. Okay, so that will explain why certain ligand is binds stronger than the other. That will explain why they have these colors. Okay, and then of course, inorganic chemistry also deal with uh, metals and ionic solids. Okay, so generally, inorganic chemistry is a study of synthesis and behavior of inorganic and organometallic compounds. What are organometallic compounds? So these are these complicated uh, coordination compound that has organic ligands. Okay, so in your book, the page you're on, there are some examples of inorganic ligand, such as halogen and the, the thiocyanate that I mentioned previously. And there's also a lot of organic ligands. Okay, so a lot of effort are put in to develop a new organic ligand to feature interesting catalytic property. But another sub branch is more of on the material side. Um, our people are interested in synthesizing metal clusters. There's another set of magic number that would dictate the stability of different metal cluster. When these metal clusters grow big enough, okay, so metal cluster that are hold together by these metallic bonds, when they grow big enough, it become nanoparticles. So people already developed various way to make fascinating geometry and uh, we have excellent shape control, which we'll briefly mention in the next lecture. So just to put color into perspective, we previously talked about gamma ray and x-ray, right? So it's on the far left of your spectrum. When we see color, the visible light, we're dealing with 400 to 700 nanometer. Then we get into near IR and IR, okay? So there's microwave, radio wave, a lot of inorganic compound and organic compound because in this range it had to do with the electronic transition and the vibration of atoms. So UV and IR are the wavelengths of interest to be utilized as an analytical tool to analyze our compound. So as I've shown you previously, the cis and transform of a metal complex had different color, right? So you can have a solution of it, and by looking at the absorption spectra, you can kind of guess what kind of complex that you have. And you can use IR to look at the bonding between the metal and its ligands. Okay, so why is there a color? So a very simple uh, explanation is um, these molecules they have is homo and lumo uh, levels. The difference in these levels, so remember in the molecular orbital theory, you have pi orbitals, right? So it goes to the pi star transition state, that means your electron is excited to a different energy level. When this relax, that will give you fluorescence, right? So this is a simple figure of why there's color, why certain things can absorb light. But of course it gets much more complicated because when you're dealing with coordination compound, you have multiple ligands, okay? There are multiple transition states in these compounds. So the color, I think you're all familiar with color wheel. The color we observe is actually the light that transmitted or reflected from the substance that we're observing. Okay, so I think we'll end for now. If you have any questions, feel free to come talk to me. Mm -hmm.